Okay, everybody, it is coming up on 8.45, so we're going to get going. Some people are still coming in, but um, we're going to get started. So good morning, everybody. Welcome, and thank you very much for joining our webinar this morning on the very, very topical issue of ESG, and we're going to be focusing this morning on the particular angle of is your board and leadership team ESG aligned? I'm Sarah Parker. I'm a director of BoardClick. I look after our major global clients in the UK and other international markets. And this is a topic that when we are going around talking to yourselves on this call and other clients around the world, this is something that is really forefront of everybody's mind. But it's something that we recognise is extremely complex and you are grappling with a rapidly changing situation but one that's increasing in importance. And so, for example, when we talk to an international board member who's on a board in Japan or, and in Europe and in the US, the conception of what ESG even means in those countries is very, very different. And the priorities assigned to different elements of ESG are very different. So I think trying to get some coherence around this for people sitting on international boards or companies that work across the world is very, very difficult. So hopefully over the course of this morning, we are going to shed a little bit of light on some of this and give you some tools that might help you to navigate your way through it. Most of you know BoardClick already because you're our clients. For those of you who don't, we are a digital analytics platform for board and C-suite effectiveness. And we will show you a bit of that in an ESG context as we go through this morning. We are recording this webinar. Um, we don't think any of you are visible on it, so don't worry about that. But we do just want to let you know that we are recording it so you are aware. So I am joined for this um, important topic this morning by uh, two experts. Uh, the first is Camilla. So I'm going to hand over to Camilla just to introduce herself to you all. I have to unmute myself. So thank you, Sarah. And uh, good morning, everyone. Well, um, briefly, I've been active in the field of sustainability for a little bit more than 16 years. Um, I started out 2006 building the global sustainability function for TLS Honor, which is the largest Nordic telco company. And then I spent 10 years in the uh, social economy, working with driving impact investment, impact measurement, social innovation, working with social entrepreneurs and forming partnerships with businesses. The past uh, four years, I've spent as head of sustainability with Hoist Finance, a pan-European publicly traded finance company. I'm also the chair of an organization called Effect Foot, uh, that is driving impact uh, measurement in the Nordics, the development of that area. And I'm a senior advisor in my own company, Common Interest. So thank you. Thank you, Camilla. And I'm joined as well by my colleague, Marlin Lombardi. Thank you, Sarah and Camilla. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Marlin Lombardi. I'm co-founder of BoardClick where I am direct director and responsible for board and C-suite solutions, which means that I am responsible for the questions we ask in all our products and the solutions and packages we bring to, to our products and to the market. I have a past um, 15 years um, or so of, uh, of uh, advising boards in, and I am passionate about, about corporate governance. I started out as a lawyer at one of the leading law firms in the Nordics and I've been a Board evaluation and consultants for many years prior to the foundation of BoardClick. Great, thank you. So I think you can all see we've got some um, some real expertise around our virtual table this morning to help you think through some of these issues. So I'm just going to take you through the agenda for how we're going to um, run the webinar this morning, and we're going to um, keep going for about another 35 minutes. So we will have you away and, and back to the rest of your days um, in not too long. But what we're going to run through today is we're going to hand over to Camilla to give us an overview of why this issue is so important and how the thinking and landscape around ESG is evolving all the time. 
then we're going to hand over to Marlin to show you how we are thinking about this issue and what we have put together on our digital analytics platform <laughs> as a tool to really help you in a very practical and insightful way navigate your way through some of this and to get some insights in how your board and leadership team are approaching this issue. Then we're going to have a bit of time for some Q&A and you can type your questions, type them at any point as we go through the webinar as they occur to you into the Q&A function. And then I can pick out some of the best ones when we get to the end. And then we will briefly sum up and we will send you a recording of this webinar afterwards as well via email. So you will have it there. So that is our plan. And I'm going to then, without further ado, hand over to Camilla, who is going to get us started on outlining why this topic matters so much for us all. Okay, thank you. Then we can go to the next picture. Our beautiful earth. I always get really filled with awe when I see, uh, see it from this perspective, realizing that it's really the source of all life as we know it. Yet, now we are on a negative path uh, when our demand for ecological resources in a given year by far exceed what the, re what the Earth can regenerate. On top of this, we are emitting greenhouse gases like never before, causing extreme weather conditions resulting <clears throat> in droughts, extreme heat waves, floodings, and so on. And that is putting an even greater strain on the capacity for Earth to regenerate the resources we extract every day. In light of this, it's also important to remember that nearly all businesses are dependent on that healthy ecosystems are maintained. And to achieve this, we all need to ensure that we understand our impact on the environment and the society and contribute to the changes that are needed for a sustainable future. Why this and why now, you might ask? Let me share some facts with you to put this into a perspective. If you go to the next picture. It took us 200,000 years to become 1 billion people on Earth. It took merely 200 years to become 7 billion. As a matter of fact, during my lifetime, we have grown from 3 billion people to almost 8 billion today. So the growth has been really fast. The next picture. The GDP has grown approximately 400 times during a period of 200 years. And the next one. And every six human being own a transportation vehicle of four wheels. And the next. And approximately half the world population is continuously connected in vo via voice or face or internet with the rest of the world. And the next. These are just a few facts to show that we have grown from being a small world on a very big planet to be a very big world on a small planet. This obviously has severe consequences and put pressure on the Earth system, both economically, environmentally and socially. Your business depends on and impact the natural environment in many different ways, through your operations, through your supply chains, through the ways your products and services are used and disposed of, and so on. 
uh, your business dependencies on the environment and society need to be managed effectively to ensure your business continuity. It's hard to create sustainable value or know how to create sustainable value in a changing world and a changing environment. But I would say it has come to be almost a question of morality today to show that your business adds value to society. This is of such urgent importance that governments uh, around the world are now aligning themselves and putting stronger and stronger requirements on business to be transparent around their particular impact on society and environment. In the area of reporting requirements and new frameworks to adhere to, there is a new wave of frameworks coming out and news every week. I sometimes feel that in the last 10 minutes, there's happened more than in the last 10 years in the area of reporting uh, requirements. These developments are the source of significant megatrends, the developments around their world, so, so, so to speak. So if you go to the next picture, uh, these, uh, these developments can be summarized in what we call megatrends. And these are just a few of the ones that have been identified during the year, past years. Just to pick a few, aging population. <clears throat> in Europe today, over 25% of the European population is 60 years and plus. This, of course, put a tremendous strain on the social systems, healthcare systems, product development, and so on. We can see beginning of a shift in the global economic power when we are moving from fossil fuel dependencies to renewables and becoming more dependent on batteries and the minerals that are required for the batteries. Mental health problems is a real growing problem all over Europe. It's a concern both for the workforce and society at, at large, of course, and something that we need to take seriously. And urbanization, today more than half the world population live in urban areas and the predictions are that by 2050, more than two thirds of the world population will live in urban areas. If we see these megatrends, not only as risks that we need to handle and mitigate, but also as opportunities where we can create new innovative solutions to create value to society and the business, then we really have a winning concept. Uh, and this requires, of course, that you have a very clear purpose. What is the problem you intend to solve? And what is the value it delivers besides financial returns? If you go to the next. Um, Michael Porter at Harvard University has been thinking a lot about this for many years, and he's talking about how to create shared value. And I think this quote from him summarizes it very well. It says that business must reconnect the company's success with social and societal progress. Shared value is a new way to achieve economic success. It's not at the margin of what companies do, but at the center. And we believe that it can give rise to the next major transformation of business thinking. So it's all about business in a way, but at the same time driving progress in society. Next picture. Many directors I've met, they feel it's very hard to wrap their arms around this ESG and sustainability area. They, it's too abstract, too fuzzy. There is no business case. It's some, something for someone else to worry about. But I would say that in my experience, if you go to the next picture, 
a strong commitment from the board is really key for a successful delivery of the organization's environmental and social strategy. I would say that when the board takes ownership of the ESG strategy, it's really the essence of the G in the ESG. It becomes a governance, part of the governance model. And what I've seen during the years I've been active in the field that without a board ownership, no matter how hard the company works with the sustainability issues, it just remains a sideline activity. It doesn't become core and part of the business. So what does this require from us as a board, you might say? And I think that World Economic Forum uh, summarizes this well. If you go to the next four points, um, because I mean, the answer is very long, but I think these four points really is to the point. So I have, I'm using those. And it is when the board really understand the potential impact and related risks and opportunities of these uh, environmental and social issues, uh, the organizations uh, of the organization's operating model. It is uh, when the board take leadership and accountability in aligning with what investors and policymakers expect and require. And it is when the board take lead in overseeing the assessment of the organization's environmental and social impact. And it is when the board enforce a, a materiality assessment and reporting process to ensure actions are well followed up through and implemented. So what are really the benefits of all this? Um, is a question I always uh, or very often get. So if you move to the next picture. Of course, there are many, many benefits, uh, but just to lift, uh, list some, a few of them. Uh, many companies experience this as also a way to achieve cost reductions and uh, put their finger on inefficiencies. Uh, the more you look at, for example, CO2 uh, emission reductions, you can also find areas where you can save money. It's also a tool for risk management and ensure the long-term resilience of the company and the business. It's also a source of innovation and business development, like I spoke about before. As more and more capital around the world is channeled towards sustainable investment and sustainable products like social bond or sustainability linked bonds and so on, you get access to lower capital costs. And last but not least, there is a war of talent out there and the talent market today demand that the company they're working for their employer is walking the talk and that sustainability is integrated into the business model, so to speak. And then also all of this provides a tool to build a strong reputation and trust of your company. You can go to next. Every company is, a is at a different stage in terms of its maturity level when it comes to ESG or sustainability. And with the BoardClick ESG maturity assessment tool, board of directors and C-suite level members will have a tool for conversation and to develop their own maturity. It could begin with making an assessment of where are we today? Do we have a common understanding of different aspects within the ESG agenda? It would be like a baseline assessment if you want. And from that, you will be able to use that tool 
to map out where do we want to be in the future? What areas is it that we really need to address that we don't have the same view of? And then from that, to plot your strategy on how, to, how do we get there? How do we become more um, well-versed in the ESG area? And how do we take ownership as a board? And last but not least, I'm a true believer that uh, you need to measure and follow up what you do and what the targets you set within sustainability. And there you can also use this tool. And if you move to the last page, uh, it's another quote from Niall Fitzgerald. He's the former CEO of Unilever. And for you who don't are not familiar with this, he is the brain behind building the very, very successful sustainability strategy for Unilever uh, that has been a case study uh, in, in many business schools. But his point was that sustainability is a hard edged business decision. And it's not because it's only a nice thing to do because, uh, or because people are forcing you to do it, but it is because it's good for the business. And our hope is with, with the uh, maturity assessment that you will be able to achieve a better alignment within the board and between the board uh, and the C-suit level management. <clears throat> and you will be able to better leverage on your ESG objectives. Thank you, that's all I had to say. So I hand back to you, Sarah. Well, thank you very much, Camilla. What a, a comprehensive overview of what is, as you say, a very fast moving, but increasingly important issue for us all. So thank you. So you set us up perfectly there, Camilla, to talk more about our new ESG maturity assessment and I'm going to hand over to Marlin who is going to take you through this. Thank you Sarah. Uh, so um, many of you uh, know, know us already but uh, I am Marlin Lombardi, I'm one of the founders of BoardClick, uh, Monica Lagerkans and I founded it in 2018 so it's a relatively young business. But uh, Monica and I together, we have decades of experience uh, advising boards and, 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 and management teams. And uh, ESG has been close to our hearts for, for a long time already. We were very lucky as board evaluation consultants to be working with some companies that were pioneering in, in, in ESG. And they brought this up to board level early and they wanted this to be a central part when they also built their board evaluations and they eval evaluated their, their CEOs, for instance. So we were lucky to have a very good material and questions and modules to, to include in our evaluations early on. But it was kind of a hard sell once. Uh, it wasn't that popular. I think Camilla brought up some very good arguments that we used to hear once at the time. It used to be things like, this is uh, too political. It's already too much about this. It's a compliance issue. It takes focus away from what we're really here to do. We Or yes, it, it's nice and important and, and, and all, but we have other things that are higher in our priority list. And this, uh, interestingly enough, did not really correlate with whether or not the company was doing well or not financially. They, there was always something more important to do. So it was a bit of a struggle, but we, we did already then collect a lot of data on this because we, we have always be, um, done a lot of evaluations. And now in the board click platform, we have several hundreds of, of evaluations and we track data on them. And we could see that questions on ESG were constantly being rate low, rated lower. There were, they had lower priority and they were also not very low alignment on these questions, meaning that in the same board of directors, for instance, there would be very different uh, opinions around this. And uh, I think we all know, of course, that a few years back, all of this 
changed in a way that we saw that uh, regulations started to, to affect companies much more. Uh, institutional investors started behaving differently. And we also noticed that active owners, so you see the family owned businesses, new generations started to, to come into power and they had prioritized this matter very differently. So I think now we're in a point where, where everybody thinks this is important. We also see that because we ask customers, which are your biggest challenges in the years to come to your strategy implementation? And ESU-related matters have um, absolutely increased in priority. But what we can see from our data, and if you would move along, thanks, Nilo. We can see that boards struggle more with these matters than, uh, than other things that we ask about. So we have different indexes that we track. We do, thank you, Nilo. And we can see that the ESG related questions in those indexes have constantly been lower than, for instance, strategy and operational excellence indexes, which are, of course, more traditional board and C suite uh, items. And we can also look at data and particular questions. Uh, we look at how well are these matters incorporated into the board's agenda? Well, almost half of all res respondents when we checked last couldn't really say that these things were incorporated into the agenda. And when they thought that they, we, are, we do have this in, agenda if, in our, our, our agenda, even if maybe the, the average score was pretty high, you could often see a negative outlier that somebody in that board really was a, of a different opinion. And I think that also goes back to what Sarah mentioned initially, that you can find very different opinions and expectations on what good looks like in this area, even in the same board of directors. And another, another item of concern is this, how are we how effectively are we measuring the company culture and that we used to get the pushback on that also uh, in the past saying that this is not hardly a board issue and uh, um, i mean it, it's, it's not appropriate to ask about it but that has changed of course everybody has heard the the, the saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast and also now in many jurisdictions it's really in the codes or in the rules that the board must take responsible for this responsibility for this. And when we read about corporate scandals, it's very often the culture that has somehow broken down. So all of this kind of motivates that motivated us to, to start developing a niche product for ESG. And we hope to do this on more to burning topics in the boardroom. And uh, this has been done in, co in connection you know, or in collaboration, sorry, with Camilla. And we've also had the input from many other experts and board members uh, during this development phase. So uh, need, next slide, please. What is included? I know that's very, very interesting. That's one of the first questions we typically get. Well, there are a number of questions. What we have tried to do is to take this very vast area and simplify it for you so uh, what we, we we are kind of starting from purpose strategy the wider uh, scope and then taking it through the materiality assessment and then going into more details but i think camilla would you care to elaborate here absolutely um yeah the the, the logic here is to start with the bigger picture and then you know funnel the questions down so to speak, it is a huge area to cover. And we are also really well aware that there are a number of industry specific uh, issues and questions. Uh, but in order to be able to launch the first version, we have focused in this version on the very core questions that are applicable for all industries. And then if there is an appetite, of course, we will look at industry specific sections, but this is the first release and this is the core and it should work for all industries. Next slide, please. 
So um, how does it work? Uh, many of you are familiar with, with our product. So it's in uh, the Barclay platform. You um, decide who should uh, participate. The board of directors, of course, you, you might want to single out the chair because the chairman will have different, um, has a different role and can have more information and, uh, uh, than the rest of the board on certain of these matters. Uh, and you uh, typically want to invite the CEO and maybe others from the, the, the senior leadership team uh, that are working close to the board and also working with this kind of matters. Could also be interesting to, to have an owner representative or a, um, advisor of sorts uh, reply on this and give their view because it's very interesting to see how aligned the answers are and where the deltas are. And once you everybody has responded, uh, the report is automatically gen generated in your platform and it can easily be shared from there. And it's uh, this uh, very easy to understand summary that you first get and you get an, an, an index score. In this test case, it is not that high. And you can see from the spider graph next to it where you should focus your efforts. So you see here that purpose, they seem to have that covered, but diversity and inclusion that is something that they score very much lower on. So it's very easy to, to understand what you should discuss more and debate. I also wanted to add here that it can also be really interesting say that this is the graph from the board survey. And then you do also the same survey, for example, for the management team. And then when you look at them both together, you might see that the, in this example, I'll say that the, the, the management team scores very high on diversity and inclusion, but the board does not. Then there is an area where there is a huge discrepancy and then that will be something to be invest, investigated. Maybe the company is doing a lot of things with diversity and inclusion that the board is not aware of, for example. So I think that to, to, the, um, to be able to elaborate with this tool for different groups in the company and the board is a, is a huge source of uh, learning of what areas do we need to work more on. Absolutely, because my, in my experience, apart from the, the alignment issue, the different expectations of different board members coming from different backgrounds, etc., on these issues, it's also the information asymmetry. That there's so much going on in the business that the board doesn't know about. So I think this will help also. It will help the management to 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 understand what they need to talk talk to uh, tell the board about. So we also have flight results here, and that are individual questions that are have received lower scores than we would have expected. And they have been set, they have, all the questions have individual thresholds because some of these questions are almost hygiene factors. By now, every company should have gotten there already. So it's worrying if you don't have a very high score, whereas others might be, well, for some of the companies that we work with will be pretty understandable. They haven't really gotten there yet. And then they will be triggered only with, with really, really low scored scores. And that's the, the most, the lowest flag results will be picked up by the, the executive summary. So next slide, please. So uh, then you can go down and see every question, of course, how has that been rated? We have different types of questions. So you can see that the uh, multiple choice and open questions. And I think open questions are so important in all our products and in this one in particular, since the area is a bit new, it's vast, different expectations. And also, I think many people sit on other boards and have seen good things other in other places. And so we ask a lot of questions, how, how should we do this in the future? How can we improve or how can we contribute more? And I think that would be very valuable as well. Go forward, please. And uh, then you can see the deltas. That's very uh, fascinating. In this case, of course, it's a test case, but you can see that the chairman is so positive and he, he or she really doesn't have the, the rest of the board with, with them. Because so that's a source of discussion as well and where you can increase alignment. Next slide, please. 
And then, of course, within a group, you want to look at the distribution because maybe the board has a pretty high score, but if you have a negative outlier, that's something you want to know. And that could be that one person who just ha has a completely different uh, opinion of what good looks like regarding, for instance, diversity and inclusion matters. And uh, of course, here you will be tracking your trends. So of course, what we believe will happen is that you will see this, you will talk about it, you will decide on, on, on um, actions and you will uh, measure them. And a bit later, you can do this again and you will find that you are more aligned. And next slide, please. Okay, well, super. Thank you so much for that overview, Marlin. That's really, really useful. Um, we're going to go into a Q&A, but actually we've just had a brilliant question come in, which ties exactly, Marlin, to what you were just talking about. Um, is a benchmark included in the ESG maturity assessment? Because benchmarking is a standard feature, as many of you will know, of Board Clicks um, digital analytics platform. So Marlin, what are, what are your thoughts on benchmarking on this new ESG assessment? That's a great question, thanks. And uh, yes, we will uh, offer benchmark. Now it's new. So of course, now we're collecting data. So when we have a critical mass, uh, we will absolutely offer benchmarking on the indexes and also on the questions and, 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 and areas. Fantastic. So the quicker you all get filling it out and completing it, <laughs> quicker we can then provide you with um, some benchmarks and as Marlin said you will of course get your own trends year on year or you know however periodically you want to to run run the assessment great um so we've had a couple of other really good questions that have come in over the course of the um presentations so um Camilla you were explaining about how we've alighted on those six initial key areas for um, assessment as part of this new tool um, and you said it would be applicable to all companies will it be applicable all over the world absolutely i mean this is an area that is um, growing more and more global with a global common view of what we need to the areas that we need to address and of course uh, there is a huge focus on the environment and climate change to begin with, and there are global discussions or global alignment there. And uh, the aspects that we have picked out in terms of social aspects are becoming also more and more a common global view on. So yes. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've had a really, oh, this I love this question. When is it available? We have demand from our audience. When, when can they have this? Marlin. <laughs> well, it, it's available now. We're pushing okay. it to production. So. Well, the final slide will be contact details. So, so keep watching <laughs> and very soon you will, you will get the right details to find out how. Then I'm just going to take one final question, which is what do you mean by materiality? You've used that phrase, both of you, a couple of times over the course of the webinar. Could you just explain to our, our guests what you mean when you say materiality? Uh, absolutely. Uh, materiality, when we speak about materiality, it's really to identify what topics uh, within the ESG frameworks and sustainability that are most important and of most relevant to your particular organization. And usually you find those or identify those in dialogues with your key stakeholders. And that's both internal key stakeholders, but also external key stakeholders. It could be your investors, it could be your customers and um, so on. But it's really to identify what's most important and topics for your particular company and industry. And then you build your sustainability strategy on that, on those findings. Very helpful, Camilla. Thank you. Now, I said that was the last one. We've had one final one. So, Marlin, you're going to have to do a quick fire answer. Are we going to be updating the questions and the elements of our assessment as the themes in ESG are changing? 
Absolutely, that's crucial, and, and that was a very good question. I, I actually forgot to mention it. It's uh, this you have to. This area is moving so quickly, so it will be updated uh, many times a year. Okay, right. Well, we have come to the end of our allotted time, so I am just going to sum up. Firstly, thank you very much to Marlin and Camilla for your insights. Uh, I think and there input. was one more question, Sarah. Oh no. Um, I can't see that we were anything that we haven't got to we will take offline so anybody if we haven't for some reason got to your question don't worry we will come back to you on it. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly summarize what has been a very, very rich debate so I won't try and summarize everything, but I think it's very clear that this is no longer optional it's not a question of whether we engage with this it's a question of how we do it. Um, Camilla said that she feels like more is happening in 10 minutes and in the last 10 years. So over the course of this webinar, we've had 40 years worth of um, ESG action. <laughs> but don't panic. We are here to help because this isn't just about managing risk. It's also about seizing opportunity. And I hope that what you've seen us talk about from our new ESG maturity assessment is really to give you the tools so that you can identify where there are gaps, where there are where there's misalignment potentially in your organization, but critically where you can take advantage of opportunities to really drive forward ESG and what it means for your own company in your own context. So Nilu, contact details, final slide. So if you want to know more and those of you who want the product, please get in touch. We will get straight back to you. And we are going to send you this webinar, as we said, as a recording to your email. So you have it as a reference point as well. But thank you all so much for joining. Really appreciated your time this morning. And we hope you found that helpful. And we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks.